into the chat and we'll try and answer some of those as well. If you like the kinds of online programs you're seeing from us, you can become a member and get advanced notice of special programs and offers, including our upcoming writers group discussion on Ray Bradbury. Our YouTube channel has videos posted of programs from the past three years. You can check that as well for news and updates and recordings of events you might have missed. Our book selling partner, both when we're open and here online, is Seminary Co-op Bookstore. You can order online from them or from bookshop.org as well. We're grateful to all of you for being here and for valuing the past, present, and future of American writing. Um, I'm coming to you live um, from the American Writers Museum. We are, of course, closed um, in the current conditions and we'll look to reopen in the future. Um, but we will continue to believe, bring you uh, programming and events online uh, for the foreseeable future. This program today is the latest in the Gene and John Rowe program series for My America, presented in conjunction with the exhibit of the same name, which can be viewed at our museum on Michigan Avenue when we reopen, or anytime at my-america.org. Some of the first words in the American Writers Museum come from the stories of Native Americans, and we honor their work not just as the beginning of America's story, but as a vital and living part of its present and future. During this Native American Heritage Month, we are celebrating the publication of a new anthology, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, a collection of Native Nations poetry edited by current U.S. Poet Laureate Joey Harjo. We're joined today to hear readings from that anthology from three of the most talented Native American poets working today. Tanea Winder, um, one of the anthology's contributing editors, is a poet, writer, artist, and educator who was raised on the Southern Ute Reservation. She is an enrolled member of the Duckwater Shoshone tribe. Uh, Mark Turcott, the author of several collections of poetry and recipient of numerous writing fellowship, teaches creative writing as a visiting assistant professor in English at DePaul University here in Chicago. Spent his earliest years on North Dakota's Turtle Mountain Chippewa Reservation and in the migrant camps of the Western United States. Laylee Long Soldier is a citizen of the Oglala Lakota Nation. She is a winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry and a finalist for the National Book Award and a recipient of a Native Arts and Culture Foundation National Artist Fellowship. I wanna say welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm gonna to drop off and let our artists um, speak to you and read to you um, and I'll be back for questions and answers. So please, if you have questions, type them into the Q&A box. Thank you again, everybody, and looking forward to hearing from all of our wonderful guests. Mike, good morning, everybody. So grateful to have you all tuning in and joining us. Honored to share space with Laylee and Mark. We're so excited to kick this off. We're going to be reading um, from the anthology. You might not see it well from my virtual background. Um, some of us might be reading some of our newer work. Um, but we're also going to be sharing other voices from the anthology as well, just so you can hear. We're going to start off with Mark Turcott. I'm going to read his bio. Again, Anishinaabe from Turtle Mountain Band. Grew up in North Dakota on the Turtle Mountain Reservation and later in Lansing, Michigan. Turcott won the first Gwendolyn Brooks Open Mic Award and the Wisconsin Arts Board named him a literary fellow in 1999 and 2003. He has published four books of poetry and his work has appeared in several anthologies. He lives and works in Chicago. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Tanaya. I'm really glad to be here. Hello, Laylee. I'm glad to see you. Uh, we got to hear each other yesterday, but only uh, didn't get to see each other. So terrific. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I, I want to thank Tanaya, first of all, for for being our, uh, our, our uh, driver behind this get together. Um, Thanks for thinking of me and including me. It's been sort of a, a what, 15 year long uh, wish of mine to have a chance to uh, read with Lele because I first met her down at IAIA. Um, and when I think you were just finishing up being a student down there, Lele. Um, and uh, I was really excited uh, when I got to meet her and, and especially when I got to read her work. Um, it just seems like forever ago. And now look at now look where you're at, you know. And uh, Tanaya uh, is somebody new to me. I, I don't know Tanaya that well. We've met a couple of times. I saw you read at AWM, actually. So I just want to acknowledge that. And, um, thank you for that. So I guess I'll read a couple pieces um, of my, the two pieces of mine that are in the anthology. And then I was going to uh, recognize another another one of the poets in the anthology with another reading. Um, there are two poems of mine in the anthology 
that are from a series from my book, Exploding Chippewas. And I, I was saying on the radio yesterday, I, I was wondering why they chose one of these poems because it's, I don't know, it, it's always a one, you always wonder why people choose what they choose about your work, you know. First one is called Battlefield. And it's for my sister, Jackie Sue, who, is, uh, who has left us. Back when I used to be Indian, I am standing outside the pool hall with my sister. She, strawberry blonde, stale sweat and beer pours through the open door. A warrior leans on his stick, fingers blue with chalk. Another bends to shoot. His braids brush the green felt, swinging to the beat of the jukebox. We move away. Hank Williams falls again in the backseat of a Cadillac. I look back, a wind off the distant hills lifts my shirt, brings the scent of wounded horses. Burn. Back when I used to be Indian, I am crushing the dance floor, jump boots thumping, Johnny Rotten, Johnny Rotten, red lights blue bang at my eyes, the white girl watching does not know why and it doesn't matter. I spin, spin, eat, I don't care for breakfast, so what for lunch? She moves to me, her dark gaze, tongue hot on lips. The music is hard, lights louder. She slides low against my hip to hiss, go, go, Geronimo. I stop, all silence. He sits beside the fire at the center of the floor, hands stirring through the ashes, mouth moving in the shape of my name. I turn to reach toward him, take one step, feel my skin begin to flame away. Um, it, both of those books or both of those pieces are from a very distant times in my past. Um, the piece Burn is about when I was living in East Lansing, Michigan and I, with a whole bunch of uh, women in a house and I would go out dancing with them and dance with all of them all at the same time um, when there were punk rock bands coming through town and um, and I'm just I was really tickled that they someone decided that they wanted to put that poem um, in the anthology because it's kind of special to me and I don't usually read it very often out loud you know at readings and things um, and one thing I wanted to do is our, our colleague and our friend Hyde Erdrich um, obviously is included in the anthology. And I thought while I had the chance, I would read her piece from the anthology, but also um, do a little Indian 101, which is one of the things that often happens with native writers. I feel like I do this a lot and other writers that I've talked to do this a lot. We spend a certain amount of our artistic energy uh, responding to stupidity. That's the best way I can put it to things that have written by non, been written by non-native people about native people for, you know, several hundred years now. Um, and sometimes it's not, it's not on purpose, it's not malicious, but it's often just ill-informed, misrepresentative, um, it misdefines us. And we often spend a lot of time kind of like reappropriating that stuff and, and taking back our own stories and telling them in the way we wish. So this is an example, it's kind of extreme uh, in 1961, when John Kennedy was being inaugurated as president, um, Robert Frost was invited to read um, at the inauguration. And the story goes that he had a poem written or a, something written that he was gonna say and he forgot it in the hotel room, but knew this poem off the top of his head. So he read this poem called The Gift Outright, which if you put, it, put your eyes in native mode, you'll see why it's an unpleasant experience for native people but it was so right there in our in, in people's faces. You know, I was a child when this happened, but people have told me over the years that, you know, so many native people were counting on John Kennedy to, to be a president for us, you know? Um, but it's called The Gift Outright by Robert Frost. The land was ours before we were the lands. She was our land more than a hundred years before we were her people. She was ours in Massachusetts, in Virginia, but we were England's, still colonials, possessing what we still were unpossessed by, possessed by what we now no more possessed. Something we were withholding made us weak until we found out that it was ourselves 
we were withholding from our land of living and forthwith found salvation and surrender. Such as we were, we gave ourselves outright. The deed of gift was many deeds of war. To the land vaguely realizing westward, but still unstoried, artless, unenhanced, such as she was, such as she would become. Um, I think that poem was actually from maybe even the 30s, 20s. Um, and Hyde's response, um, I've, I've always loved this response. Um, it's called The Theft Outright. We were the lands before we were, or the land was ours before we were a land. Or this land was our land, it was not your land. We were the land before we were people, loamy roamers rising, so the stories go, of formed clay, spit into with breath reeking soul. What's America but the legend of rock and roll? Red rocks, blood clots bearing boys, blood sands swimming being from women's hands. We originate originally spontaneous as hemorrhage unpossessing of what we still are possessed by, possessed by what we now no more possess. We were the land before we were people, dreamy sunbeams where sun don't shine, so the story goes, or pulled up a hole, clawing past ants and roots. Diné, in documentaries, scoff DNA evidence off. They landed late, but canyons spoke them home. Nomadic Turkish horse tribes they don't know. What's America but the legend of stop and go? Could be cousins left on the land bridge. Contrary to popular belief, that was a two-way toll. In any case, we claim them, give them some place to stay. Such as we were, we gave most things outright. The deed of the theft was many deeds and leases and claim stakes and tenure disputes and moved, moved plat markers stolen still today. We were the land before we were a people earth divers, her darling mud puppies, so the stories go, or emerging, fully forming from flesh of earth, the land not the least vaguely, realizing in all four directions, still storied, art-filled, fully enhanced, such as she is, such as she wills us to become. That's Heidi Erdrich. Um, also, Anishinaabe Turtle Mountain Band, I should, I should brag. And I need to mention this little thing and I'll turn things over. Um, this, you know, someone said to me, well, you know, a lot of this stuff is from a long time ago when people, you know, weren't as woke or aware as, as they are now. So this, this idea that Frost is throwing out that this continent was unstoried, artless, is just so insulting, you know? And it is old, but just 10 years ago when I was in Santa Fe, uh, where Laylee is, I went to a reading by a rather well-known, very actually successful story writer. And when she came on stage, she said, every time I come to this part of America, I think about how it must have been, I'm paraphrasing here, I think about how it must have been when the original settlers came here to this unstoried place. It was almost the exact same phrasing. And her implication was like, how wonderful to encounter a land where you can be the first ones to make stories there. And I had some students at, from the Institute of American Indian Arts who were attending that reading and they sort of got up in unison and like left the room, you know, after they did, you know, they, you know, I felt so bad for them and I felt bad for me sitting there too. But anyway, a little lesson. Thanks so much tonight. Thank you, Mark, for that beautiful reading. And can you just tell us again one more time what was the poem by Hyde that you read? It's called The Theft Outright. Perfect. I know some folks are interested. Thank you so much. I think it's in her uh, National Monuments book too, you know, but it's in the anthology. Perfect. So thank you all again. I'm going to, um, so my name is Tanea Winder. I'm enrolled in the Duckwater Shoshone Nation. I'm also a Pyramid Lake Paiute, Southern Ute, grew up on the Southern Ute Reservation in Ignacio, Colorado. Um, I have my MFA from the University of New Mexico. I've published two books so far, uh, Words Like Love. It's actually being reprinted by UNM Press for this spring, um, right before Valentine's Day. And then a second book called uh, Why Storms Are Named After People and Bullets Remain Nameless. 
And I'm actually going to start by reading a poem um, in the anthology by Linda Hogan. Um, I first became introduced to her work during my senior year um, at Stanford, and we read her memoir, The Woman Who Watches Over the World. And it just blew my mind. And it's what led me to working with youth. And that book in particular led me to doing some of my first um, writing to heal workshops. And so I'm gonna read one of her poems from this anthology and it's called The History of Fire. My mother is a fire beneath stone. My father, lava. My grandmother is a match. My sister, straw. Grandfather is kindling like trees of the world. My brothers are gunpowder and I am smoke with gray hair, ash with black fingers and palms. I am wind for the fire. My dear one is a jar of burned bones I have saved. This is where our living goes and still we breathe and even the dry grass with sun and lightning above it has no choice but to grow and then lie down with no other end in sight. Air is between these words, fanning the flame. So again, that's the history of fire by Linda Hogan and just so grateful for her work and words and everybody in this anthology. So I hope you all go out and get it because it's, it's so powerful and it's heavy, like it's literally heavy, but it's also emotionally heavy and beautiful as well. So the poems I'm going to read um, from my anthology, one of these, um, and I'm really grateful that these two poems are in the anthology because when this came out, I was like thinking, oh, I'm done if I never write again, at least I'm in, <laughs> in this book with all of these awesome people. Um, but this poem I wrote actually um, after I lost a dear friend of mine to suicide. And I just want to share it because I know a lot of people are struggling with mental health right now in the quarantine and being isolated and just to remind people you to always reach out for for help and to let people know if you need someone to talk to. This is called the Milky Way escapes my mouth. Whenever two lips begin to form your name, I cough stars lodge deep within my lungs. They rush from tongue weighted in dust words I didn't ask, where are you going? Or notice the blank spaces in your breathing as you slept. They say the more massive the star, the shorter the lifespan. They have greater pressure on their cores. Yours burn so brightly. I should have known you'd collapse, disappear into image, a black hole dissolving trace amounts. I am left stargazing five times a day for years, catalog phrases, chart every word, label every facial expression, telescope until my eyes bleed constellations. Even then, I can't navigate my way into understanding light years, how we let darkness slip in. Is it madness to wonder if it ever really happened you, a shadow never leaving until I inserted continents between us. I lost you in the crevice between night and day. You died while I was sleeping, dreaming of a galaxy far, far away where love eclipses. A rising tide of longing fills my body, bones, the ribs sheltering the cave within me echoing. Each night I open mouth sky wide to swallow stars and sing to the moon, a story about the light of two people who continue to cross and uncross in their falling, no matter how unstable in orbit. And so the last piece I'll read um, is also in this an anthology and um, you'll hear some of those same phrases like, where did you go? I feel like loss is something I'm always going to be writing about. Um, and this comes from just asking my grandmother. Uh, she recently passed away just a couple of weeks ago. So um, I'm honored in any way I can continue to share her memory. But I was trying to learn Shoshone from her and have her teach me phrases. So this poem comes from that experience. It's called Learning to Say I Love You. My favorite conversations are with my grandmother while she teaches me words in Indian, as she says. I ask, how do you say, where did you go? 
and where are you going? Questions that layer my tongue in ash, reminding me of fire, the taste. Each time I speak, the slow burn of every loss I have witnessed cracks my lips. Go and going, axe singed into my bones, so I ask, teach me I'm coming with you. So it sits rock heavy in my mouth because my tongue is at war with history. Boarding school, kill the Indian, save the man. Acts of colonization, strain pronunciation when I want to say, take me with you. It dissolves. Before I can stomach the sweetness of language ours, I am losing. I am lost, lodged somewhere in my throat between decades of broken syllables. Teach me how to reach the ones who are born already running. Teach me how to talk to the ones who need it most. Dear universe, gift me words that linger softly like dusk. There must be a phrase to contain wherever you go, whether or not you know where you've been or where you are going. All right. Thank you. So next I'm going to hand it off to Laylee Long Soldier. I'm so excited to be reading next to Laylee and Mark. The first time I heard Laylee read was actually at a um, AWP conference. I believe it might have been in Minneapolis, although they all blend together. But I was just in awe. Like I had never like been like that, like viscerally and emotionally inspired by a poet in such a long time. Like she just rekindled my fire and I just that's the only way I can describe it was just being in awe of her and her gift. So Laylee Long Soldier, Oglala Lakota received her BFA from the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe and her MFA with honors from Bard College. She, she published her chapbook, Chromosomery in 2010 and her 2017 collection, Whereas won the National Books Critics Circle Award and the Penn John Stein Book Award and was a finalist for the National Book Award. In 2015, she was awarded a National Artist Fellowship from the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation and a Land and Literary Fellowship for Poetry. Laylee Long Soldier is also an installation artist. Welcome, Laylee. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, good. And thank you for that introduction. Uh, I was saying your last name incorrectly for so long. So I'm glad that um, I'm here and I get to share this time with you and and also correct my, uh, <laughs> the way that I'm pronouncing your last name. So, um, but in any case, uh, I'm happy to be here with both you and Mark. And I have a quick question for the host of, uh, of the event. I wonder if I can share screen. Is that possible? Um, maybe let yeah. me know in the chat bar. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, oh, we'll, wonderful. Okay. We may have to make something happen in the background, but go ahead and try. It should go. Okay. I'm going to the uh, this morning. I'm not going to read the piece that is published in the anthology because it takes about 16, 15, 16 minutes to read. So I'm going to share some other work, which actually, uh, as uh, Tanea uh, mentioned, I am a visual artist as well. So I have some poems that come from some visual work, and I thought I would just share some of that this morning. Um, just for fun, right? Because why not? Let's see what I can do. Okay, so you guys have to ignore the first few pieces. Can you see that? Can yes. you? Okay, so please ignore the first few pieces you see in this in the, this uh, presentation. I'm going to file, let's see, how do we do view? And we're gonna do slideshow, okay. So ignore this part, okay? <laughs> here we go. You get to see, but in real quick view, okay, here we go. You got to see some of my uh, visual work. I'm gonna share a couple pieces from an exhibit uh, 
called Midakoye Oyasin. And this was an exhibit I participated in with two other Lakota artists. And I had two large scale pieces uh, that measured 12 feet by 12 feet. And basically what I did was I took a, do you see this? This is a star quilt pattern. If you guys are familiar with star quilts. And I enlarged the pattern so that each diamond in the back pattern measured one foot long. And um, I created, I made poems to go inside each section of the star quilt. So I'm gonna read, I'm gonna share two pieces from one of those star quilts. And they were made with heavy cotton paper from India and sewn with a copper wire. So you'll see, um, these were the finished pieces. And inside those white dots that you see, the white dots are actually text that was laser cut into the, into the pieces. What I'm gonna share with you today, which is different, I often read from this, this quilt or this piece, but I'm gonna actually share work that comes from the multicolored um, piece today. And this one was titled Mosquitoes. Uh, and it had some stencil work, you can see. That's uh, the other artist, Mary Bordeaux, who participated as well. That was some of her work. There's a porcupine <laughs> that's inside an installation. This is uh, Mary and Clementine Bordeaux, who were the other artists. Okay. So this is what I'm going to share with you. Um, I from that multicolored star quilt, I made eight poems that come from a short story written by Zinth Kala Shah. So I wanted to honor kind of my literary ancestors, if you will, today. And Zinth Kala Shah was one of the first published Dakota writers, a Dakota woman writer. Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> and I, I, um, used a, a piece titled The Widespread Enigma Concerning Blue Star Woman that she wrote. And what I did was I separated out parts of speech from that short story. And what I found by stripping away the particulars of the story, some of the particulars of that era, is that many of the issues that she was writing about at the time remain the same today. And many of the, the way, the, much of the language that she used uh, to, to write about issues of identity, land, uh, resistance and so forth were the same as today. And it was really eye-opening for me, both for uh, looking outward but also uh, looking at our own community and the language that we use with each other for certain issues. So here we go, I'm gonna share that. That was a long explanation. <laughs> okay, you ready? Um, so you'll see the, the diamond shape here. This is what is in each diamond and it becomes a piece that the viewer can make their own poem, depending on which direction they go in. So I'm gonna read this. Who am I? Was no longer the obsessing riddle of her life. The morning taught deep abstraction. I am a being in its center and answer to who were your parents? Who am I was no longer a persistent question. Her inquiry prompted deep abstraction. I am a being in its center and answer to who were your parents? Who am I was no longer the persistent question. Unwritten law held deep abstraction. 
I am blue star woman in its center an answer to who were your parents? Who am I had become proof of membership in the tribe. Unwritten law required deep abstraction. I am blue star woman, be that as it may, the government means who were your parents. Who am I had become proof of membership in the tribe. The white man's law disregarded deep abstraction. A piece of earth is my birthright. Be that as it may, the government means who were your parents. The fact was the circumstances of her early childhood were matters of dispute as the sharpened names from her tribe boiled like black smoke and coffee, fire between her and her heritage. The fact was circumstances of her family tree were unrecorded as the speared names from her tribe boiled like smoke blackened coffee, fire between her and her heritage. The fact was verbal reports about her family tree were contradictory as the lifted names of her memories boiled like smoke blackened coffee, fire between her and her heritage. The fact was verbal reports about old, old teachings were contradictory as the added names of the dead boiled like the hot breads, sing fire between her and her heritage. The fact was verbal reports about old, old teachings were of far greater importance as the roused names of the dead, boiled like the hot breads, sing fire between her and her heritage. Thank you. <laughs> I hope that was okay and it wasn't too long. That was amazing. Okay. I don't know if there's time. I did, I think we were asked to share a poem written by someone else in the anthology. Should I do that? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll close the whole thing with a, a piece by a friend. I wanted to read his poem. Um, this is a poet that we lost this year who passed away a few months ago, uh, Brian Bearhart. In the anthology, he is listed as B. William Bearhart. And so I wanted to read this in honor and in gratitude for all that he gave us as a poet and as a friend. This is titled, When I was in Las Vegas and saw a Warhol painting of Geronimo. I thought we could be related, Andy and I. We're both what blue walls and yellow cows in a gallery of pristine white. We're both screen prints, offset and layered underexposed, were both silver clouds filled with helium and polluted rain, were both white and blonde and scared of hospitals, only I'm not really any of those things. And then I thought we could be, re we could be related, Geronimo and I, were both code names for assassinations, were both first names you yell when you jump from a plane, were both gamblers and dead and neon acrylic brush strokes on a screen printed image. Only I'm more like a neon beer sign sputtering in the tavern window, 
burned out, broke a heart with arrhythmic beats. Thank you so much, Laylee. Um, Carrie, did you want to come back on? Sure. Um, first, I just wanted to thank all three of you. Those were amazing pieces, and this is wonderful uh, to hear, and this is an amazing anthology. Um, I think if uh, attendees are looking, you'll see that in the chat there's a link uh, to buy the book, um, so we encourage you all to do that. Um, and I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, if anybody wants to submit questions, again, use the Q&A function at the bottom and we'll start reading through some that have already been submitted. And please go ahead and submit some more. Um, I'm gonna start, uh, well, there was just somebody who wanted to say something uh, and I don't know if any of you know Jay McDee. Uh, I had the privilege to copy edit the anthology. The collection is powerful and each poem both educated and inspired me. Thank you all for sending your words and voices into the world. So just wanted to read that in case any of you knew who that was. Um, and uh, the next question uh, is from someone named uh, at most Waslet, because that's all I can see. Um, but uh, Waslet wanted to know what inspired each of you to become poets. Necessity. <laughs> I have heard that answer before. <laughs> yeah. I think the first time that I read Itsy Bitsy Spider, I knew I wanted to be a poet. That's where it started. In a little reader book on the res in North Dakota. Today? Ooh, I don't know. I, I like the necessity answer. I feel like only now can I confidently be like, I'm a poet. But <laughs> I think you just been inspired. I think just again, just needing to process, needing an outlet, needing to be able to transform things into something beautiful. Um, Laylee, how about you? Uh, I, I'm gonna sound so unoriginal, but probably necessity too. <laughs> I started studying uh, poetry at the Institute of American Indian Arts because they did not have a music program <laughs> uh, when I was younger, I played music, and that's what I wanted to do. Uh, so, but I also wanted to go to school there, and I went to enroll, and they didn't have a music program. So I was, I kind of shrugged my shoulders. I was like, oh, "Okay, well, I guess I'll try <laughs> writing." <laughs> and then, um, but somehow, uh, the the beautiful thing is, I found. You know, as I started studying, I found I had abilities uh, that I didn't know I had. For example, I didn't know critical thinking was a thing. Like, <laughs> I was like, what? All these crazy things I've been thinking about and like, you know, that maybe bother me sometimes or, you know, uh, issue, issues that uh, mean something to me or whatever. Um, that they had a place and they had a, a place in the writing world in poetry and so on so that was pretty exciting yeah awesome <laughs> um this uh, question's a little deeper um i'll start with you Lely, uh and then we'll work around um uh, the attendee has asked um he says he or he or she says they're fascinated by the embodiment of ancestral memory and painful history through poetry how much does research play a part in weaving into your poems? How much of it comes from feeling one's way through the poem, through what you already know about um, your own history? Well, you know, the thing with embodying history, for me, I think, you know, this idea of um, ancestral memory or what have you, I think that we can't always know actually uh, what is embodied. At least I don't think I can know that for certain, right? Um, and even if I'm operating based on that memory contained in my DNA or certain things are being expressed or come out, I, I can't be sure. I, I don't really know that myself. So in fact, 
uh, a lot of my work maybe that deals with history does require quite a bit of research and research does not just mean turning to books and the documents it means also turning to family and community members and so on and um, one thing I have learned is that in in researching and in working with history or what have you uh, there are so many different tellings and so many different um, perspectives so um, I have to always and there's there's a lot of decision making in that as artists like what uh, what perspective, what version are you going to work with, you know? Um, so that, that was a long answer. I'll allow the other people <laughs> to. Anaya, do you have a response to the question on research versus your own uh, personal experience? Yeah, I would say that, you know, it's different for everybody, just like everybody's healing journey is different or grieving journey is different. Like, you know what you need. And I would say the same thing happens when you're writing about, or for me, when I'm writing about like history or things my people or my personal family has gone through. Sometimes, like Laylee said, it's just talking to other people, maybe talking to elders from my community. But sometimes it could be researching. Like right now, I'm reading a bunch of books about Sarah Winnemucca from my tribe on my Paiute side, and I'm just learning so much. And, you know, I don't know if those will turn into poems. Maybe they will, but it's just, I kind of just go in the direction I feel called or pulled to, and I hope I'm being guided in, in the right way. Okay. Mark, any different thoughts? Yeah. Um, all of my research is accidental. <laughs> uh, stuff that I discover when I'm, I'm trying to please myself with readings or, or learn things myself. Um, sometimes they end up in my work, but I tend, to, I tend to be one of those writers who I'm very careful about speaking for anybody else. Um, I have an, a hard enough time, a difficult enough time embodying my own work, let alone trying to embody uh, a culture or a history. Um, I, I hear a lot of voices. It always irritates me when poets talk about all the voices that are speaking through them into their poems. And um, I, I don't have that luxury and I don't really know if anybody does, but for me, it's just voices who are just speaking to me and reminding me of who I am and what I need to know about myself. Um, I hope when I'm at my best, you know, that's, that's what's going on. And I hope that ends up in my work, you know? Um, and sometimes, you know, like even the bear heart piece there, you know, there's this quick mention of uh, Geronimo and right away, probably the three of us as native people, native writers know, that Bearheart is referencing the fact that Geronimo was the code name that the Bush administration and the Ob um, Obama administration used for Osama bin Laden. So one of our great cultural heroes, Geronimo, was insulted in that way by you know being used as a code name for America's so-called worst enemy. You know, and that that sort of makes you feel very unwelcome, you know, it doesn't take long for you to figure out what your country thinks of you, your supposed country thinks of you when they do that to your. Yeah, it's um, kind of like, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't want to like pile on and start mm -hmm. a, a whole uh, complain fest, like <laughs> complaining. but I will say what you said reminds me kind of of the recent CNN election polls referring to all of our uh, over 500 uh, and something First Nations people, right. uh, uh, the na tribal nations as something else. <laughs> Literally, they typed out something else referring to our uh, contribution, our voting in the, in the election. And um, so it's, and so what it is was an indication of what still what the mainstream uh, you know media and um, probably many in this country still think how they regard native people yeah <laughs> absolutely and people don't see that unless they're us mm -hmm. and by us i don't mean just we three but you know um, those who have our shared sort of experience i guess memory 
Thank you. It was a good question, and I appreciate all your responses. Um, the, I have a question directly for Lele, um, just about uh, the poem you were reading, Blue Woman. Um, yeah. There are different paths. Um, do you read it differently each time, or do you tend to read it the way you read it today? Yeah, I read, uh, I have about 16 poems from the, that uh, installation, and I read all of them differently every time. <laughs> <laughs> because I like to be entertained. I like to have fun. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, thank you. The, can, um, I just mention, can I just mention, Carrie, that um, I saw Laylee do this live at Northwestern University, you know, with a, you know, projected and I was just flabbergasted, um, but not surprised, you know, with that mind, you know, working that way. Um, but it reminded me of Taimba Jess, you know, his book, Olio, in which he has all these sonnets that can be read backward, forward, back, you know, you can skip lines and skip onto other lines. And there's just dozens of ways to read them. Um, Tayimba, who has a, a Chicago connection, by the way, um, was here in the nineties um, and he won the Pulitzer for that book. So, you know, get those poems in a book lately. <laughs> I'm yeah. really smart. Yeah. Really. <laughs> it, uh... Yeah, it is an amazing piece. Um, the, uh, I have a question about um, from Susan Neal, who was wondering uh, from each of you, and Tanea, if you want to start off, um, in, in this anthology, were there any new writers or poems that you discovered um, or anything that stuck out to you that wasn't something that you knew before um, that interested you? Yeah, I th I definitely discovered a lot of a lot of new poets. Um, thankfully, with social media, I feel like now I'm able to see more. People can share more. But my high school, they didn't really expose us to a lot. I think we read "Bless Me, Ultima" and one Shakespeare book, and we just did like crosswords and found <laughs> things like that. It's not challenging. And then um, Stanford was very much like. Um, not diverse in my English department as well at the time. So it was only in grad school that I started actually finding native literature and like doing research myself. So I, th I think this um, anthology for anybody just wanting to get to know more about um, indigenous poets, it, it's a, an amazing resource. Um, my turn? Yeah, sure, absolutely. By the way, that's my sweetheart, my wife asking that brilliant question. Um, <laughs> thanks, honey. Um, was probably on the other side of this wall, listening, giggling, maybe. Um, one of the beautiful things about this book is that the way it's arranged, um, it's arranged by areas. So like, uh, you know, I think I'm in the, I and Laylee, I think, are in the uh, Plains Mountains section. And then the poems in each section are laid out by the chronology of the births of the writers. So it starts with older stuff, often some traditional stuff like songs or or poems written by um, anonymous native people at, you know, at the boarding schools or something. I mean, it's really amazing. Like you can, I could hardly turn a page without discovering something I'd never seen before. But I, I really found that as I moved forward in time to all the younger poets, I, I, know, I know this, I know it in my mind that there's a lot of young native writers right now, like more than ever, that it's just this amazing pulsing thing that's happening in our world. Um, but I had no idea how many of them and how really skilled and accomplished they are, you know, above and beyond, you know, their years. So for me, that's been the, the biggest fun is discovering all those young writers that I sort of knew about that I've seen here and there, you know, lurking around in the backs of rooms and stuff, you know, so, um, so that's been a thrill for me. Lately, is there anybody that you discovered in this anthology that you had not seen before that you were intrigued by or inspired by? Well, can I be honest? I was one of the editors for this. <laughs> so in our discussions, I mean, I want to say I, I was involved early in the process. And then um, because of time limitations and so on, I could not uh, get into some of the nitty gritty that uh, the other editors took on as it progressed. So, but I was 
part of the, the early uh, discussions and looking at the various writers. So I'll be honest, I was already familiar with many of the writers uh, by the time the book was published, but I do appreciate what Mark uh, mentioned about how the book is organized by regions. And, um, and there really were poems that um, I would, maybe I am familiar with the writers, but I wasn't familiar with all of their work. And so there were some surprising poems. For example, the piece I read today by uh, Brian Bearhart uh, and, and many others. So, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, next question uh, from Jeremy Carnes. Uh, you discussed lately a little bit um, about literary ancestors like Sikala uh, Shah. And um, so they, what Jeremy wanted to know was who are some of your other literary ancestors that you find yourself returning to over the years as you continue working? Well, I mean, this is this is gonna sound like I'm just plugging this book so much, but <laughs> you know, I will say a lot of my literary ancestors are in this book. Uh, and I would say a lot of them are native writers. And uh, the reason that I continue to return to a lot of those people, for example, I mean, they're not that much older, I would say, but, you know, for example, Joy Harjo, Simon Ortiz, uh, Leslie Marmon Silko, some of those of just uh, maybe even one generation uh, uh, before mine. Um, but I, I return to a lot of those writers because I often find just like Zint Kalasha, the, the, the short story that I took uh, made a poem from, um, I find that they are dealing, even back then, we're dealing with many of the same issues that I am thinking about now. But my job is, my job as an artist is to do things differently, you know, to refresh it. So a lot of issues such as identity or land or what have you, uh, rights, uh, sovereignty, um, th those are very old, <laughs> you know, I didn't invent those, those things to write about, but I, I, I like to turn back and think about how uh, my, my literary ancestors, my um, literary family has written about them before, and I, I, then I want to do something, uh, maybe tilt it or shifted a bit, yeah. Okay. Um, Mark, any thoughts? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, everyone, everyone that Laylee just named. Um, and and we're, because sometimes we're kind of a small community, we have lots of opportunities to meet each other and, and run into each other out in the world. And and sometimes that has been even, even more uh, nourishing you know, than running into people's work. Um, it's always wonderful when you find out that, you know, a poem you admire um, by a poet that you admire uh, turns out to be a person you admire. That's always a good thing. Um, and, you know, if I, if I want to get all, you know, up in the hills, uh, Turtle Mountain on everybody, you know, all these young people are my literary ancestors too. They just, we just don't know it yet, you know. So um, they're all, you know, I think we're all just kind of feeding each other, you know, but to be explicit, um, a lot of native writers I know have, have not a lot, several have quoted this line by Adrian C. Lewis from his poem, uh, Elegy for the Forgotten Oldsmobile, an 80s poem, I think. Um, and somewhere in the middle of the poem, there's this line, I'm in the reservation of my mind. And that line, I ran into it much later um, after people mentioned it to me and it's and I could see why it just opened doors for people that line and for myself I have a little line I should mention uh also no, long, no longer with us Jim Northrup um the wonderful Anishinaabe poet um the last line of one his one of his poems is that's when I realized that surviving the peace was up to me and that line as simple as it is has just always stayed with me and struck me deeply um in almost every moment of my life, that line kind of echoes in the back of my mind. It's up to me, you know, surviving the peace is up to me. Um, 
So that's how it happens for me. And it's not just native writers, of course, but since that's what we're focusing on today, mm -hmm. um, let's give them the shout, shout out. Right? And Laylee, you know, both of these, both of these women just inspired me right now. So. Today, how about yourself? Yeah, I also agree that everybody in the book, Joy Harjo has just been an amazing um, mentor and, and light. And um, I would say um, also Sarah Winnemucca and uh, my, my grandma and my mom, you know, just listening to them tell stories and they're not going to be published or in anthologies, but they're like my, like our elders are the original storytellers, you know, and I think just listening to them and um, taking that in, I think is, I, I consider that like my, my inspiration. That's great. Um, and I, I want to start with you today on the next question. It comes from uh, Seema Karup. Karup. Um, and it was a question about craft. Um, and it kind of goes back to one of the poems that you read early on. Um, uh, have it, any and all of you found an impulse to weave indigenous language into your poems? Uh, language preservation seems to be one of the most pressing issues facing Native American communities. So this person was wondering how you've used it or think to use it. Yeah, so I'm still trying to learn my languages. I have phrases in one of my poems um, that's online using like a ute, ute dictionary that my community came up with. Um, and some of them like have apps now. I know for Shoshone, there's an online dictionary um, with you can hear like the, the, the phrases um, I have, so I just am trying to use words in my poems, but it's, it's a, like a struggle because again, like not as confident in, I don't always know the pronunciation if I'm just reading from a dictionary. Um, and with those things, for me, I always feel like I have to kind of get approval to do it. So I often like share it with the elders first to see if it's okay. I know one of my songs, I have a phrase to Teveak, which means it's a good day in the Ute language. And so um, one of the elders taught me how to say it and I showed him my song and just like ask are these things okay you know and I think I will keep doing that just to help me learn the language but it's it's a always a decision like if I want to like put it out there. Mark, how about you Mark? Um, I don't have much to add to that you know I'm one of those people who I as a child um I'm told I don't remember it very well. You know, I was learning um, Anishinaabe Muin and um, and some hybrid languages of French and Anishinaabe Muin. Um, but when I when I had to leave the reservation as a child, um, I lost those things. So, but they sure sound familiar whenever I hear them spoken. You know, <laughs> and I sometimes wonder if people don't talk to me in those languages. You know, in my sleep. Um, because they sure sound familiar. It's one of my great, great sadnesses is that I was taken away from those opportunities. And my brain is just too old now to, to learn them. Laylee, how about you? Uh, well, I will say uh, my relationship or my way of working with native language has changed over the years. And that's okay, because I, I we all change as we uh, get older and continue in, in our field in writing and making poems and making art. So when I was younger, even in my book, uh, I have some poems, some pieces that will have, that where I use certain phrases or words and, when I was younger, I did that because I wanted to feel closer to a Lakota language. I wanted to use it in interesting or new ways or maybe meditate on it, I suppose. <clears throat> but these days, I don't, I realized I actually, even just visually looking at one word sort of isolated on a page or in sounded by English, uh, I, I had to step back just for me and think, oh, what am I doing? Like just even conceptually, what am I doing to our language? You know, it, I felt pity for my, I felt sad for, for those little words all by themselves. So, you know, I mean, just, I, 
I don't know. I, I picture them as like little people, you know? So, um, but I will say this, uh, I am actually, I've, I've started like this weekend, actually, I'm teaching a Lakota language and a poetry workshop with one of my aunts, my auntie Tilda. And so what we're doing is we're teaching how, how to speak or write four simple sentences, sentence structures for present tense first person. And then we will teach the students how to combine those sentences in surprising ways to make a poem. So the point of that is we're hoping each student can leave the class with one poem written 100% in Lakota language. And the reason, and the point of that is too, to also encourage myself and other learners <clears throat> to realize that you do not have to be completely fluent in order to make something beautiful. Uh, so as poets, we're not completely fluent, I would say in all of English language or all of poetry, and we still make interesting things, right? So I think that we're, we're interested in doing that with our young people, with our community as well. That's, that's a wonderful answer. And I think it's gonna lead into, cause we're, we're hitting the hour mark. Um, a last question uh, from uh, Ruben Avila Rodriguez, uh, who really just wanted to know what advice each of you might give to young writers who want to write literature as you are. Read. <laughs> Read voraciously. Danae, any thoughts? I agree. And I used to hate it when people gave me that answer, like, well, you have to read. I'm like, oh, but I just want to do it. I just want to write. But um, it's right. I agree with Mark. <laughs> Reading, I think, just helps you learn what's been done to see what's possible, like, and get inspiration and do what Lely was talking about, like, figure out how you're going to build on it. How are you going to do something, something, something different? But I, yeah, so I would say read and also just practice writing, because I think a lot of young um, young people just have so much to say and it's good to just practice getting it out there, practice your craft, practice revising. That's great. Laylee, any advice for the young authors out there beyond the workshop that you're doing and, and the work? Um, of course, I would, I would agree with um, Tanea and Mark, but maybe to add something new, um, I would say also just cultivate and appreciate appreciation for language itself as an art that is your primary material as in poetry your primary material is language just as if you were a painter it would be paint and canvas and brushes your material as a writer is language so get a little uh you know a journal have a journal or piece of paper with you always and collect language that you hear, language that you encounter, interesting words, phrases, and write them down. Cultivate that. Don't just rely on yourself and your little tiny dictionary that you have inside of you. Uh, develop that relationship with your material and, and collect it. And then come to the page and use some of that, you know, and make it fun, exciting. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I, I want to thank all three of you for being with us here today, for, for reading, um, for reading your own works, for reading other people's works, for answering our, our visitors' questions. Um, we really appreciate this and all that you do for the art of writing um, and for our culture um, and our country. So we appreciate that very much. Um, and I just wanted to uh, thank you all. I wanted to thank our audience. Um, I wanted to say we will post again in the chat the link to buy the book. Um, and we encourage everyone to do that. Um, I was also told um, by one of my staff to remind people that uh, our podcast, um, uh, Nation of Writers podcast, uh, episode two airs on November 25th. 
which is about Sequoia, who created the written form of the Cherokee language. Um, so please subscribe to our podcast and check that out. And again, thank you, Tanaya, Mark, Lele. You have all been wonderful. And thank you to our audience. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. See you later. Bye. Bye.